Cleopatra VII died more than 2,000 years ago, but she remains one of history's most intriguing women. Famous for her beauty and intellect, the Egyptian queen had a short but scandalous life that has inspired many works of art, literature, and films. Most often portrayed as a femme fatale due to her romantic relationships with Julius Caesar and Mark Anthony. However, Cleopatra wasn't just a seductress, she was one of the most successful and powerful queens in history. So today, let's take a deeper look into one of the most notorious love affairs in history. Don't forget to like and subscribe. In 42 BCE, Rome's three most powerful men carved up the Republic among them. The triumvirate of Lepidus, Octavian, and Mark Anthony was an uneasy alliance after turbulent times. Placed in charge of the eastern provinces, Mark Anthony found himself far from Rome and immersed in the Hellenistic culture he had always adored. It was a heady combination that drew him into the arms of Cleopatra, Egypt's beguiling queen. She was the divine, Ptolemaic ruler of prosperous Egypt, brilliant, silver-tongued, charming, scholarly, and the richest person in the Mediterranean. On the other hand, politician and soldier Anthony, supposedly descended from Hercules, was broad-shouldered, bull-necked, ridiculously handsome, with a thick head of curls and aquiline features. Boisterous, mirthful, moody, and lustful, Anthony had been a favorite of Caesar. But after Caesar's assassination, he had become in charge of Roman's rowdy eastern territories. In 41 BCE, Anthony sent for Cleopatra while he was staying in the magnificent city of Tarsus, near the coast of what is now Turkey. However, this love story started when both Anthony and Cleopatra were in their prime. He had first met Cleopatra in Rome when she had been the young mistress of his mentor, Caesar. The two even had a son, Caesarion. But now, Anthony was beating a very evolved Cleopatra. The Greek writer and philosopher Plutarch wrote, Caesar had known her when she was still a girl and inexperienced in affairs, but she was going to visit Anthony at the very time when women have the most brilliant beauty and are the acme of intellectual power. Cleopatra was well aware of Anthony's love of spectacle and of Rome's interest in her riches, so she orchestrated an entrance into Tarsus designed to awe Anthony and his cohorts. According to Stacy Schiff's Cleopatra a Life, she sailed into the city in an explosion of color. She reclined beneath a gold-spangled canopy dressed as Venus in a painting, while beautiful young boys, like painted cupids, stood at her sides and fanned her. Her fairest maids were likewise dressed as sea nymphs and graces, some steering at the rudder, some working at the ropes. Wondrous odors from countless essence offerings diffused themselves along the river banks. And the scheme worked. The Greek historian Appian wrote, The moment he saw her, Anthony lost his head to her like a young man. But that wasn't the end of Cleopatra's scheme. She threw extravagant parties and dinners for the Romans, flaunting her riches by giving away all the furniture, jewels, and hangings from the soirees. She drank and sparred with Anthony, who was ambitious to surpass her in splendor and elegance, throwing his own parties, but they never quite lived up to hers. Now could Cleopatra actually win his heart? Though it appears their attraction was genuine, it was also politically savvy. Historians say Anthony needed Cleopatra to fund his military endeavors in the East, and Cleopatra needed him for protection, to expand her power and assert the rights of her son Caesarion. Hence, a love affair between the two leaders wouldn't be against their best interests at this point. Anthony soon followed Cleopatra to Alexandria, which was experiencing an artistic, cultural, and scholarly renaissance under their queen. These two powerful rulers often behaved like college students, forming a drinking society they called the Society of Inimitable Livers. The new couple also loved to tease each other. One legend has it that at one party Cleopatra bet Anthony she could spend 10 million sestresses on one banquet. According to the Roman chronicler, Pliny the Elder, she ordered the second course to be served. In accordance with previous instructions, the servants placed in front of her only a single vessel containing vinegar. She took one earring off and dropped the pearl in the vinegar, and when it wasted away, she swallowed it. Now, while this love affair started off quite passionate, things got a little shaky along the way. 
Anthony was soon off to Rome to report on his triumphs. By 40 BCE, in his absence, Cleopatra gave birth to their twins, Alexander Helios and Cleopatra Selene. That same year, Anthony married another intelligent dynamo, Octavian's sister, Octavia. Seemingly happy in his new marriage, Anthony and Cleopatra did not meet for the next three and a half years, until the lovers reunited again in Antioch, the capital of Syria, in 37 BCE. How do you think that worked out? Awkward. The two picked up right where they had left off, even issuing currency engraved with both their faces. In Antioch, Anthony met his twins for the first time and bestowed large swaths of land onto their mother. By this point, Cleopatra ruled over nearly the entire eastern Mediterranean coast, from what is today eastern Libya and Africa, north through Palestine, Lebanon, and Syria to southern Turkey, except only silvers of Judea. For the next two years, the couple would often travel together as Anthony's military and administrative exploits took them all over the Mediterranean. It was during this period that Anthony's military prowess began to falter, causing him to lose thousands of men. Of course, instead of the blame being placed on Anthony's rash, bullheaded decisions, it was placed on Cleopatra. Plutarch writes, "So eager was he to spend the winter with her that he began the war before the proper time." And managed everything confusedly. He was not master of his own faculties, but as if he were under the influence of certain drugs or of magic rites, was ever looking eagerly towards her and thinking more of his speedy return than of conquering the enemy. Anthony's fortunes, however, were briefly reversed when he successfully conquered the kingdom of Armenia. In the fall of 34 BCE, he triumphantly returned to Alexandria, where the Armenian royal family was paraded in chains. Reunited with Cleopatra, the two most magnificent people in the world staged an event that became known as the Donations of Alexandria. In an international provocation to Octavian, Anthony distributed lands to his and Cleopatra's children, making it abundantly clear that their family was a dynasty of the East. For Octavian, however, this was a bridge too far, and this is where things get really spicy in this love affair. In 33 BCE, the triumvirate disbanded. The next year, Anthony divorced Octavia. All pretenses of partnership and friendship between the two men were now over. Shortly after the divorce, Octavian declared war on Anthony's true partner, Cleopatra. For all of Cleopatra's riches and the couple's combined military prowess, they were still no match for the Roman army. As Octavian and his forces closed in on Alexandria. The lovers continued their decadent parties, although they now call their drinking society companions to the death. Longtime advisers deserted, as did much of Anthony's army. While Anthony was off battling Octavian's forces, Cleopatra busied herself building a new temple to Isis, which she called Mausoleum. Schiff writes, in the Mausoleum, she heaped gems, jewelry, works of art, coffers of gold, royal robes, stores of cinnamon, and frankincense. Necessities to her, luxuries to the rest of the world. With those riches went as well as a vast quantity of kindling. Were she to disappear, the treasure of Egypt would disappear with her. The thought was a torture to Octavian, but nobody expected what was to come next. It might have been so that Cleopatra was secretly negotiating with Octavian, unbeknownst to Anthony. Always the more level-headed and strategic of the two. Cleopatra no doubt saw that Anthony was doomed, but their children might not be. She had word sent to Anthony that she had killed herself, knowing that he would soon follow. She was right. According to Plutarch, when Anthony was told of his partner's death, he uttered the immortal words, "O Cleopatra, I am not distressed to have lost you, for I shall straightway join you. But I am grieved that a commander as great as I should be found to be inferior to a woman in courage." After his attempted suicide, a distraught Cleopatra had Anthony brought to her. Seeing what she had done, she was heartbroken but resolute. After Anthony breathed his last, Cleopatra fought on, attempting to negotiate with Octavian. But all hope was lost. Cleopatra snuck poison past Octavian's guards. When Octavian realized what happened, he sent soldiers to bust into the temple. There they found Cleopatra dead, her two attendants, Carmian and Eras, near death. With Cleopatra's end, Egypt became part of the Roman Empire. 
Caesarion was murdered. While Alexander Helios, Cleopatra Selene, and Ptolemy Philadelphus was brought to Rome to be raised by Octavia. Mark Antony's death removed the last obstacle to Octavian becoming sole emperor of Rome. He assumed the title Augustus in 27 BCE and erased all traces of the once glorious couple. But Augustus did make one concession. Honoring her last request, he had Cleopatra and Anthony buried side by side. If you liked our video, don't forget to subscribe and follow our channel for more videos like this one.